Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to free webinars from Ingenta. All of our webinars are on the Ingenta YouTube channel. Today, we're delighted to introduce you to our guest responsible for spreading the word about CrossRef and the many services it offers. She's a frequent and regular presenter at conferences and panel sessions. Rachel is going to introduce us to the joy of DOIs. So what are they? Well, a DOI, or Digital Object Identifier, is a string of numbers, letters, and symbols used to permanently identify an article or document and link to it on the web. A DOI will help your reader easily locate a document from your citation. If you think of it as a social security or national insurance number for the article you're citing, it'll always refer to that article and only ever that one. Every DOI is unique. Here at Ingenta Connect, we're nevertheless surprised at how many journal articles submitted to us still do not contain DOIs, and new journal publishers still ask us what they are. Our new open access platform, Ingenta Open, relies on them such to the extent that we cannot accept an article without one. So, handing over to Rachel. Rachel, tell us about DOIs in more detail. How do publishers get them, and how does Crossref fit into the picture? Thank you, Byron, um, for the introduction. And yep, welcome everyone to the webinar today. Um, I hope that you can. Um, I hope you can hear me clearly. So I'm going to start by giving a bit of an in introduction to Crossref, and that will help me put what DOIs are, how they work, and why they're important into into context for you. As mentioned in the introduction. My name is Rachel Lamy. I'm Head of Community Outreach at Crossref. Um, and my role there is to, is to make sure that, um, that we're talking to publishers, funders, hosting platforms like Ingenta and other organisations about what Crossref does, why we provide an infrastructure that's based around DOIs and how they can how they can work with us so crossref we are a not-for-profit organization um, for for what we call members which is a mix of publishers um, and other organizations and our aim is that we want to make research outputs so as an organization um we were founded in the year 2000 initially by 12 12 publishers um, we've now grown to have 38 staff based between the UK, the US and Europe. The 12 founding members of Crossref were publishers, probably some of the, you know, the, the big ones that you've heard of. Um, but we've now grown to having, having over 11,000 members from lots of different places around the world. Um, so that's been that's been a positive change for us, um, and I think it means that it's not just big publishers or STM publishers that work with Crossref. It's lots of international publishers working in lots of different subject areas, and a lot of those also publish um, open access journals. As a membership organisation, um, it's important that we work with our um, with with our members and we do that by having advisory groups and committees that help advise us on new products and services importantly we have a 16 member board which is made up of a cross section of international publishers um, so making sure that all of our members viewpoints are represented when we're thinking about what we should be working on if as if you are a Crossref member and assigning DOIs, then you're able to vote to to put in your vote towards who is included on that on that board. So if you're a small publisher in India, it might be that there's um, there's a representative who you feel would accurately represent you, and you can vote for them. We normally announce those in September and have a board election every November at our annual meeting. Um, and our current board members are based across a range of publishers. So I just wanted to show who we have now. 
This will change slightly in March 2019 when we'll bring in representatives from African Journals Online and California Digital Library. We've got over 11,000 member organisations, as I mentioned, so we, we've grown a lot over the 18 years that Crossref has been um, has been running. We have a metadata store of 100 million scholarly content items. Um, what that means is that DOIs and metadata for over 100 million journal articles, books, conference proceedings um, that our members register with us to let the world know that they exist. We talk a lot about, um, about DOIs, but really they're, they're just the start of what working with um, a DOI registration agency enables. We also offer a wide array of services that are based around the DOI to make sure that scholarly, scholarly publications are registered, linked and distributed. We keep the metadata that publishers deposit with us and we make it available via our open APIs and search. So let me talk about why that's important. So as a, a publisher would have a what a publisher will do is they will register their content with Crossref. So enough information on a paper to uniquely identify that paper. And they will also give a DOI number to that paper to uniquely identify it. It might be that the publisher does that themselves, or in many cases, they might work with a, with a hosting platform like Ingenta, or a service provider who registers the metadata for them in the form of XML. Having that information deposited with Crossref in a standard format means that we can make it available for use by lots of different services um, that, that, help, um, that help people discover and use scholarly content. The current slide shows you some examples of that. So, You've got um, tools that um, tools that try to analyze how much a piece of research is being used, either through citations or things like Twitter. Um, it can be used in um, it can be used in author profiling tools. So adding a list of um, your publications to something like your ORCID ID, having DOIs and metadata registered with Crossref makes that easier. Bibliographic management tools, to give another example. Um, if you're working in something like um, EndNote, when you're writing a paper, you can put in a DOI and it will look up the full citation information for the piece of research that you're using and add it to your reference list. So it's helping, it's helping, um, it's helping make things work more efficiently and helping people cite and link to research as accurately as possible. Tens of thousands of library discovery systems also use the information that Crossref has to make sure that their, um, that their, their users can, um, can reliably find and access content. So I've talked about some of the reasons already but publishers join Crossref to help their content get discovered. If it has a DOI and it's in the Crossref database, it's then made available for use by lots of different tools and services by default. That's not the full text content necessarily, but it's giving, um, it's giving tools, services, and other users a way to accurately find the content and then if they have access to it, then they can get access to the full text. So that happens by showing where the content is located and that can be updated when the content moves. So 
a publisher will deposit, as I said, a DOI and metadata about a publication with Crossref. Part of the metadata that they deposit with Crossref contains the URL of the piece of, of the landing page for the journal article or the book chapter or the conference paper. If that content moves to a new, new location, maybe you change publisher or hosting provider, maybe the name of the journal changes, maybe the name of the country changes, this happens as well, a publisher would come back to Crossref and update the URLs for all of the DOIs that they've registered with us. And what that means is that anyone linking to that content using the DOI will be able to still click on that DOI link and be taken to the content in its most current location. So it doesn't break like a URL would whenever content moves. So it's that's why we call it a persistent identifier, because it helps researchers find and link to research in the long term. Because of that, using DOIs helps drive more traffic to publications because they'll persistently link to the, to the piece of research and because the, the Crossref metadata is used by thousands of organisations to do so. It turns references into hyperlinks so that, um, so that any reader of a paper can easily click on a link in a bibli um, in a bibliography or reference list and be taken reliably to the piece of content that they're looking for online. Obviously, if you're reading a news article and you're clicking and you click on a link to follow it and you get a page not found notification, that's annoying. But in the context of research, it's really important for a researcher to be able to follow the thread of a piece of research. Maybe to, so that they can replicate experiments or further their own research. So being able to link reliably is so important. Instead, we can look at Crossref to see who is how many, how many, how many, and it also means that, as I said, metric services are able to use the DOI and um, to hinge their products around so that they can track other types of usage. And it also helps publishers participate in other collaborative services um, that Crossref runs. And I'll explain about those um, later in the webinar. As said, there, our growth has been, um, like any organisation, slower to start with, but accelerating over time. Um, it used to be that um, our biggest members would normally come from um, Western Europe and the US. Um, but even looking back between sort of 2016 and 2017, um, you can see that a lot of our members were coming from Asia Pacific, Eastern Europe, and Latin America, and you can still see sustained growth in North America and Western Europe as well. So, as Byron said, there are still a lot of publications all around the world that don't have DOIs, that don't have DOIs allocated to them yet, but the rate at which they're adopting DOIs is picking up because, the, um, because um, organizations realize their importance. And I think also for, um, um, for example, if a journal is interested in being indexed in something like um, DOIJ, the Directory of Open Access Journals, having DOIs is important in order to, to make that happen. So I think that's why we're seeing greater adoption from, um, from on a more global level than we did initially. People sometimes think Crossref is just for journal articles, but it's much wider than that. Um, our second largest content type is books and book chapters. We see a lot of conference proceedings being registered, and we also accept um, DOIs for standards, peer reviews, databases, um, 
And in 2016, we started to accept um, the registration of DOIs for preprints um, under what we call posted content. So organizations are able to um, preprint servers, are able to become Crossref members to register DOIs for their preprints. Part of what they can also do is in the Crossref metadata, they can link the preprint to the published article if they know that one exists. So that also helps discoverability of the published article, the preprint, and it helps people who are using the Crossref metadata make links and follow how research has evolved during the review process. So just to, to show the kind of um, the, the uptake that we're getting, journals are definitely still, um, still the biggest in terms of, journal articles are still the, the biggest in terms of DOI uptake. But you can definitely see large chunks for books and conference proceedings. Um, and then, as said, I think in the next one of these graphs that we generate, preprints will have their, their own section as well. So this, um, this whole graph accounts for the 100 million plus DOIs that, um, that we, we currently have registered in Crossref. When I talked about why, why publishers and publications would join Crossref, one of the things that I said is that it lets them participate in other collaborative services. So it can be easy to think about Crossref as just being, I guess, kind of technical and, oh, you know, you just, you just provide DOIs. But as a member organization, we provide more, we provide Yes, infrastructure for that, but we also provide a forum for publishers to collaborate, collaborate on services where it doesn't make sense for each publisher to, to implement them individually. Um, so creating sort of cross-publisher services um, is something else that we do, and we base those services around the, around the, the infrastructure that's been created for the registration of DOIs. So I've listed our services here, um, content registration through to um, event data, and I'm going to run through some of these services um, now just to give you some examples of, of what they will let you do. So a quick potted um, sort of quick descriptions of each of the services. Um, Content registration is our main service. Um, and that is a service by which Crossref members provide their metadata to Crossref and they register DOIs for their content. So if you're a member of Crossref, the default is that you, you have to do content registration. You have to register DOIs and metadata with us in order to be able to participate in these in these additional services because they all hinge off the metadata that that members register with Crossref. So content registration goes hand in hand with the process of becoming a Crossref member. So if you go to the, the Crossref website and apply to become a member, you can work through that process with our member team you, um, you sign an agreement, you pay a membership fee. And the, the step after that is that our membership team sends each member their own DOI prefix and account information to log into our systems um, that allow them to register DOIs. I, I, sort of, I said that a member gets their own DOI prefix and I can probably correct what I mean by that a little bit. When an organization or a publisher joins Crossref as a member, we give them a DOI prefix, which is the 10 dot, maybe 1234 or 12345 um, that comes at the start of each DOI that you see. Some people think, okay, one, it equals one DOI prefix equals one publisher, but as you know, content can move from one publisher to another over time. So 
even if uh, even if a journal is published by, for example, Wiley, and then it moves over to Elsevier, the, the DOIs that have already been assigned to that publication don't change. Um, and the prefix doesn't change either. And that's because of the, the persistent linking aspect of those. So the DOI moves so that it can be managed by the new publisher. But again, anyone clicking on that link will still always be taken to the to the piece of content in its current location. So we just give members a prefix and then they can choose their own unique suffix. So what comes after the DOI prefix? Um, that can be anything that, um, that a journal wants, but we just advise people to keep it simple. Um, it makes it easier for people to click on um, and including no special characters because sometimes they're rendered um, incorrectly online. Um, when they've when they've decided on the, the pattern of their DOIs, they then gather the DOIs, the URLs where their content sits and the different metadata associated with their content. And then they provide that to Crossref. And there are lots of different ways to do that. We work with some very large um, publishers with, with very big technical departments. We work with publishers who work with service providers or platforms to provide those services. Or there are some very small one or two people journal setups. And we have a very simple um, web interface where they can just type in the information on their publications and deposit them with Crossref. So they don't even need to go near XML if they, if they don't want to, which means that um, more publishers are able to participate um, in Crossref services. We've got a support team who are also on hand to help if, if anything isn't clear or if it goes wrong, um, which, is, which is always helpful. Reference linking is in addition to, um, is something that we, we, we like our members to do um, in addition to just registering journal DOIs. So reference link, when we refer to reference, DOIs when you publish citation lists in your publications. That, um, so, and I'll show you an example in a second, but reference linking using the DOI means that it's possible for readers to follow a DOI link from the reference list of a published work to the location of the full text document on the member's publishing platform. So it allows organizations to, to do that and provide simple linking. That's often done at the um, either at the publisher with their production team or via a service provider um, or a hosting platform. It can be different in different cases. One of the aspects of joining Crossref is that by doing so, publishers are agreeing to link out to other publishers' content using the DOI. And that was something, again, when Crossref started back in 2000, publishers were signing individual agreements between themselves to say, yes, I will link out to your content online if you link back to my content online. And you can see that now that we have 10,000 members, or 11,000 even, it's not possible for every publisher to have an agreement with 10,999 you know, 10, other publishers to agree to link with them. That's just not how research, how research works and it needs to be linked up so that it can be followed. So there's a community aspect of Crossref as well. So you're agreeing, yes, we want we want to register our content. We want to we want to get DOIs, but we're also agreeing that we will link to other publishers' content, and they in turn agree to link back to ours. So that helps discoverability, and it also helps um, to, it also helps drive um, drive traffic to um, drive traffic to content. So just um, just a quick example. So in this um, in this journal article, if I hover over publisher full text with my cursor, 
instead of seeing a URL link to the um, to the full text in this um, in this other publication, when I I I'm being taken via the DOI link to that other publication. So it, it might be something that you haven't noticed before, but maybe you will in future. So when you see reference lists in journal articles, you would expect them to be linking using the DOI and not the URL because, um, because the URL would break in time, whereas the DOI works more, more persistently. We also have um, a service called Cited By. Um, so when a journal article is published, you've got the reference list and it is showing you the previous research that the piece of con that the that the journal article or the book chapter is is building on. Cited by sort of works like that, but in reverse. So what it will do is it will tell you future papers that are referring back to the paper that you're that you are currently reading. Um, so just the, the, the little screenshot. So you'll be able to see on publisher websites um, citation information for the paper that you're reading. And one of the sources is often Crossref. So if an organization signs up to participate in our cited by service, we let them look at the Crossref metadata we hold and pull back a list of the newly published papers that are citing um, that are citing their the papers that they've already published they can display these on their website and it helps again to show the full um, it helps to drive traffic to research but it also helps um, a researcher see what's happened um, what other papers cite the paper that they're reading and how the research has maybe changed developed or maybe even been refuted over time Um, one of the services we provide, which is um, which is probably one of the the most popular ones, is Similarity Check, which launched back in two thousand and eight. And Similarity Check it it provides a service to help publishers um, check their the papers that are being submitted to them for originality before they publish them online. So. If a Crossref member decides that they want to participate in this service, um, they allow the content that they publish and, and register with Crossref to be indexed in a full text database of publications, which includes content. That database it includes content from a large number of Crossref member publishers like Elsevier, Taylor and Francis, um, Springer Nature um, and lots of um, and lots of other publisher members. It also contains offline content from um, organisations like Gale and EBSCO, and over sixty billion web pages have been indexed in the service as well. So, a Crossref member who wanted to participate would let their content be indexed in that database. What they get in turn is that they get um, access to what's called Authenticate, which is a tool that allows them to upload papers that have been submitted to their publications. They will be checked against that massive database of content. And then the Authenticate system will provide them with a report showing them the paper that they uploaded and provide them a report of the other um, the other sources or the other papers or publications or web pages in that database where it has found matches um, between the text. So it helps by reading that report and looking at the details, um, a publisher or a journal editor can ascertain whether the research that's been submitted to their journal is original, whether it's citing other content correctly, or if it's using other material without the correct attribution, um, because obviously you don't want to publish anything that's going to infringe on someone else's copyright 
or is is trying to is trying to use someone else's work without giving it the the proper attribution so similarity check lets um lets organizations compare the text of their manuscripts to that content to try to identify and avoid them publishing something that's that's been plagiarized from another piece of work um, and the final service that i'll talk about is the um the funder registry um, if you work in publishing, you'll be aware that um, that funders are increasingly involved in um, in setting the agendas, in setting the agenda for how research is published, and they're also increasingly interested in being able to track the outputs of the research that they fund. So a way for that information to um, a way for them to do that is to look at the the published outputs um, of their researchers. So in the information that Crossref collects and publishers, we've given them we give them the option to use um, our funder registry to choose the funder who um, who funded the piece of work and to have that registered with Crossref um, when the paper is registered with us. So the funder registry is, um, it's a list of over 19,000 um, research funders linked to a persistent identifier. So like a DOI for a funder. When an author is submitting to a journal, they can identify their funder and a lot of submission systems allow them to, to choose the funder who funded their research from a list which is based on the Crossref funder registry. When a publisher then registers that paper with Crossref, they provide that funding, that funder information in the Crossref metadata. And because we make that information available, funders can use our search tool or they can directly use um, the Crossref metadata in order to look and see how many papers were published that are linked to them as a funder. And this helps them see if, um, if the publishers are, so to get a sense of how the research, that, what the, the publications that the research that they funded has resulted in. So we're doing increasingly more work with, with funders, um, but they find it very useful to be able to, to be able to, to use this source, which aggregates that information across, um, across thousands of, of publishers, rather than having to go to each publisher individually to ask for the information. I think sort of one of the the final things I wanted to to talk about is um we talk a lot about DOIs um, and I think what's really important as well is the the metadata or the additional information that accompanies those DOIs with Crossref. So I think this is kind of a maybe not a plea um, but maybe just to state that when publishers deposit information on the publications with Crossref. Um, we ask them to try to make it as as complete as possible so making sure that they list all of the authors um, on a particular paper um, making sure that they provide accurate journal information including ISSNs and ISBNs page numbers and also additional information as I said like who funded the research maybe license information and reference lists so that um, it makes it even easier to, to be able to find the research that, um, that you're publishing. If you are a Crossref member and you're not sure how good yours is, um, you can get in touch with, um, you can get in touch with us in lots of different ways to ask. We have a new tool called Participation Reports. You can just go to the Crossref website at this address and, and search for Participation Reports. And that's a tool where you can type in the name of your publication or the name of your organisation and see what metadata Crossref is holding for, um, for, your, for your publications, how many DOIs have been registered, 
over what period of time. So it means that um, it, it's much easier for organisations to see what information they're providing Crossref and um, what they could be doing more of or if they're just doing really well uh, and that's great. Um, we've got different social media accounts that we um, that, that you can use to keep up to date um, and I'd also recommend our blog. New things that we're working on, places that we've been, um, questions that we're getting asked, new services or tools and um, we'll always post about those on our blog so it's a good place to come to just to kind of keep keep up to date. If you've got questions about becoming a member um, you can get in touch via members or support at crossref.org. As I said our support team are really good, really helpful um, and they can um, they can point you to, to the to the right place to to get your questions answered in Crossref. I wanted to leave enough time for questions at the end of the webinar. Um, so I think at this point I will say thank you for attending. Um, I hope this was useful. Um, if it generates more questions, um, please please get in touch. But we, we, we'll be happy to um, answer any questions that you have. Um, I can see one question in the chat window actually. Um, asking, does a journal get a DOI or each article in the journal? Um, so for the purposes of discoverability and linking, um, each, each individual article in a journal would get a DOI. Um, so don't, I wouldn't just assign a DOI at a journal level because it's more useful for, um, for a reader to be able to click in a DOI link and go directly to the to the, the specific article that they are interested in in that journal. Next question is about using um, using DOIs for supplementary material. Um, you can you can do that, um, and I guess to be honest, it depends what that supplementary material is. Um, we have what we call um, component DOIs. So what you can do is you can you could have, say, a journal article and then you can have um, another DOI that links to that, maybe which contains the um, the data that the piece of the, the piece of research was built from, you know, was, was based off or um, or other supplementary information, such as if you publish um, peer reviews. Um, peer reviews or a survey, for example, um, you can register that information as components with, with Crossref um, so, and link those to the, the DOI of the article that you've published. So it's called our, it's called, we call it our component schema and you just give a bit of information in the Crossref XML um, or the Crossref metadata on this is the journal article this is a supplementary piece of information related to it. This is what it is, be that a data set or a review or other supplementary information. Um, and, and that's it really. And that way that someone who maybe just finds that supplementary piece of information can use it to find the, the journal article or vice versa. So it can be quite good because again, a DOI would give a persistent way to link to maybe a piece of data um, or a data set rather than them having to just um, reference the, the journal article and hope that someone finds the, the supplementary information based on that. Um, but if you want to dig into it a little bit more, um, I, would, um, I would get in touch with our support team and they'll, they'll be happy to, to help and point you to the, the correct documentation. Thank you for taking the time to, to join the presentation. I hope it was useful. Um, Rachel, thanks very much for a fascinating presentation. I 